Hello, Booktube. Well, this will come as a surprise to precious few of you, but I went back to the Brattle Bookshop. I know I said just the other day I went there, and I came back, I did a long book haul, and I said this probably is my last trip to the Brattle Bookshop this year. But I ask you, <laughs> if you had a bookstore like the Brattle near you, 15 minutes away, would you confine yourself? <laughs> if you Would you come up with reasons to go? I bet you would. And I did. <laughs> this is most certainly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, my absolutely positively final Brattle book haul of 2022. I will not be going to the Brattle next week. And I certainly won't be going to the Brattle the day after Christmas. Nope. Not at all. This is the last one. And I had errands to run in the area, and I had one or two things to pick up at the Brattle. Or I might not. If all of those things hadn't converged, I might not have gone even today, because the weather is mild, but it's overcast with very much the threat of rain. It really feels like you could get caught in the rain. And there's nothing worse than that. So, But I went anyway. I don't know. I would probably have come up with a reason to go. I'm not going back in 2022, but I found a stack of books <laughs> that I wanted to show you, especially since some of them are interesting. Now, the first one, I got a couple of paperbacks, a few paperbacks. And the first one is not interesting, <laughs> which makes you might make you wonder, why did I get it if I know that it's not interesting? I have read this book probably four times. I have grappled with it in an attempt to understand its phenomenal popularity. And every single time that I do, I come up with the verdict that this thing is bad, <laughs> that it's dumb. Self-evident, riddled with errors, but can 80 million Frenchmen be wrong? It seems impossible to me that it could be so popular, including amongst people I know have brains in their heads, and be so bad. So I'm going to give it another try. It didn't hurt that it was a UK trade paperback. I found a copy in the UK trade paperback of Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. I am not a fan of this book, but I'm going to give it another try. I'm The books that I'm getting at the Brattle these days, these last couple of hauls, are directly feeding in to my TBR, to my to-be-read pile. They are directly becoming part of that pile because the number of new releases that I'm reading is dropping precipitously. Uh, although today in the mail I got a lot of 2022 releases, I'm not under any real uh, obligation to read those 2022 releases. My 2022 is largely over. I'm not under any obligation to read them anyway, but you know what I mean. I make a, a, a shape for my reading. All of us do. Mine is just a little bit more concrete than a lot of people's. And that is to read the new releases in the American book market in the 15 or 16 genres that interest me. To read all of them. To read all of the new releases in those genres. So all the mainstream history, all the mainstream biography, all the mainstream works of nature, uh, all the mainstream works of... of uh, fairly prominent release fiction. It's a lot of reading. It's it's a lot of reading in a year, and I don't do what I set out to do. Of course, no one could. I do a fraction of what I set out to do, but it feels good to do. But I'm not going to say that I do that solely for my year-end list of the best and worst books of the year on Steve Reads on my, on my website. I'm not going to say that I do it for that reason, and I'm also not going to say that I do it for the commission book reviews that I do of new releases throughout the year. I'm not going to say either one of those things. I do it because I love reading that way. It's an old habit of mine, and I really enjoy it. I re-examine it every year, and every year it comes up roses. I'm not going to say that those are the reasons why I do it, but if I get... On December 24th, if I get a 2020 new two new release that came out a couple of months ago... I'm not going to have much, of, if any, interest in reading it. I, it can't get on my year-end list. I can't be commissioned to review it. I can't tell anybody, anybody about it in any context of go out and read this other than maybe you, my imaginary booktube friends. Maybe I could do that. So uh, I'm mostly reading older stuff for the next two weeks. And Guns, Germs, and Steel will now be on that list. I also got another paperback. This one I have read. I ranked it very highly. I think it made one of my year-end lists. And I loved it. But I got rid of my hardcover. I think I had to send it to one of you. I found the paperback of uh, Paul Elie's uh, Reinventing Bach. His study of, of Johann Sebastian Bach. That it, I remember loving this. I, I checked. The paperback does not have a blurb by me. 
and I don't remember who I reviewed this for or if I reviewed it at all, but I, I feel certain that it made a year-end list. If, I'll go looking for it uh, to find out where I talked about it. But I loved it. Really, really loved it. I love pretty much any really intelligent writing on this particular composer. And I imagine that in only a few days' time, I'll be listening to no one else. I think that's entirely likely. Then, uh, what do we see here? The other day, at the Brattle, I got this. Reginald Knox's translation of the New Testament. I mentioned that uh, I've been yearning to read classical literature and also that I've been doing a very deep dive on the Old Testament, specifically the book of Exodus. But that has led me far afield to all kinds of commentary and then for the last three days, gloriously, uh, to a, a book called the Sonsino Chumash that is... I have always loved it. I've loved it since a, a wise old Jewish woman introduced me to it. And, oh my, <laughs> it has been exactly what I wanted. In the last three days, I have been so deep, deep in the Sonsino Chumash <laughs> that I haven't been able to come up for air, even for giant killer sharks. Uh, so, I was in the mood for biblical stuff. For classics of any kind, but for biblical stuff. And I found... Knox's translation of the New Testament, which I've only barely begun to dip into. And I remembered that he did three volumes. He did the New Testament, and then he did the Old Testament in two volumes. And uh, I got both of them. <laughs> I found both of them at the Brattle. So now I have the complete Reginald Knox Bible, with all of his, his introductions and commentary, all of his footnotes, everything. Perfect. Exactly what I'm in the mood for these days. Uh... And there are a couple of other classics on this pile, but not many. Like, for instance, this thing is brand new to me. I don't know anything about it at all. It's S.C. Roberts, who I gather was a, a literary figure in England in the post immediate post-war years. Don't know anything about him at all. This is Adventures with Authors. From what little I gather from the book, this guy was uh, had two main guiding literary passions. One was Samuel Johnson, who is a guiding literary passion of my own. And the other was... Uh, the Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes stories, which are also a guiding literary passion of mine. So I think he and I are going to get along quite well. I just don't know what I can expect here. This is It's bits and pieces that he's written over the course of a lifetime. So I usually get along with books like that. We will see. All of these things are on the, ho uh, the hopper for immediate reads, despite how many new releases for 2022 that I got today. They just don't have the kind of purchase that they would have in any other month, any other week, any other time of the year. Now, it doesn't matter if I get six 2022 releases that I didn't get around to reading during 2022. I'm largely out of 2022. I largely don't care about it anymore. Uh, whereas these older things, well, I'm perfectly happy to revisit. I'll be revisiting things for 10 days. And this next one, this next one I could tell you stories about. <laughs> I read it when it first came out. I reread it a few times since. I never managed to hold on to a copy, but I found a copy today. I will do my best to hold on to this. This is by James Robert Baker, the late James Robert Baker. Still feels weird to say. And this is his novel, Tim and Pete. This is something for the gays. Gotta have something for the gays. And this is a novel of his in the early 1990s, I think. This was the early 1990s. This was, uh, it's a gay novel, and it's a gay novel that very much, yeah, 1993, very much takes place in the settled ashes of the AIDS epidemic. So the AIDS epidemic is still rampaging, but this is after uh, this is after gay people, gay men in America, and also gay authors now knew what such a plague would be like. The kind of public moralizing or government indifference that it would meet. And that changed the tenor of gay fiction for, I would argue, the whole decade of the 90s. There is no, as far as I know, great study of gay literature in the, the last... Gay literature in the, AIDS, in the AIDS era, if we have to call it that. So from the, the, the last of the great old days, 1985, let's say, to 2005. I don't, think that, I don't think I've ever read, I know that I've never read, a literary study of how and in what ways gay fiction changed in those years, changed by the AIDS epidemic and then by the aftermath of the AIDS epidemic. I don't think I've read any comprehensive literary study of that. 
And that's, that's too bad. I would read that. If such a thing exists, I would love to know about it. But this is very much that. <laughs> this, is, this is very much that. This is an odyssey of the two, character, the two title characters across uh, a dystopian American wasteland. It's the, it's the America of the 1990s, but it reads like a dystopia. And they meet all kinds of disaffected loners and misfits along the way. And some of those loners and misfits want to assassinate former President Ronald Reagan for his perceived indifference at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and the two main characters, Tim and Pete, have a long meth-fueled discussions or mescaline-fueled discussions about whether or not that is right to do. And the fact that it is presented the way it is in the novel led a whole bunch of people, when the book came out, to accuse the author of sotto voce encouraging violence, political violence, terror, political terrorism. What we would now, we would now readily use the word stochastic. And uh, the author vehemently denied it, but it really hurt his career. And, and according to his ex-lover, it led him to commit suicide. That was the main reason. That, that the, the damage to his career, the fact that he couldn't sell a book after that to make any money. I don't know, there's a darker and more complex story involved there, as there always was with this author, but uh, the book is weird and raw, and it's been too long since I reread it, so uh, it will be on the list. And it's not the only thing for the gays on this pile, but first, hoo -hoo, what might very well be the find of the day. Behind me you can see a lot of Penguin classics. Uh, treasured among those Penguin classics is Dorothy Sayers' translation of Dante's Divine Comedy. Dorothy Sayers, the creator of Lord Peter Whimsey, the author of very successful murder mysteries, was also a, a, an ardent scholar and did a translation of the Divine Comedy, Hell, Purgatory, and Heaven, along with enormous amounts of critical apparatus. Long, loving, scrupulously intelligent introductions, extensive notes, amazing. It's an amazing version of Dante. I don't know why, considering Dorothy Sayers' pen name recognition, I don't know why Penguin has never come out with a big one volume of her Divine Comedy. I don't, nobody has done that, as far as I know. So all I have are those ratty old mass markets that I had. Every once in a while I used to find a trade paperback, a Penguin trade paperback, but I never found all three. And you want them sort of together. So I've been every time I go back to the Divine Comedy, every time I want to look at Dorothy Sayers' Divine Comedy, I'm always going back to those old paperbacks. And they just weren't made for that kind of use. So Imagine how happy I was when I found a hardcover box set of the Dorothy Sayers Divine Comedy in at the Brattle. It, they slip in and out of their case easily, and these will last me the rest of my reading life. So, And they're a box set, which I love, which means I can just put this on the floor of the room. I don't have to worry about finding shelf space for it. I can just put it on the floor of the room. Or I can put it on the top of a shelf. Or I can make it the bookend of a shelf of books. Fantastic. I had no idea that the Dorothy Sayers Dante even existed in hardcover, much less a box set. So I was overjoyed. Then, uh, when I was at the Brattle today, I was, of course, browsing out in the sale lot. Brattle, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, is a used bookstore in Boston, and it has a sale lot next door to the main store that has thousands more books for $1, $3, or $5. You can browse forever. It was a mild morning this morning. We are not getting we're not getting anything like the blizzard warnings that so much of the rest of the country is. We're going to get a dip of cold weather when this frontal system moves through tomorrow. But this morning was perfectly comfortable to just browse to your heart's content. And I did. And at one point when I was looking I wonder if I have an example here. When I was looking at the at the sale lot, I saw a modern library a little modern library hardcover of Lewis Auchincloss's novel, The Rector of Justin, which is really good. It's widely considered to be his best novel in a lifetime of writing novels and short stories. The guy never stopped writing, and he lived a long time. I'm not 100% sure that I consider it to be his best novel, but I bought every thin, precisely controlled hardcover novel that this guy wrote. I bought all the story collections. And I looked at that, I had that Rector of Justin in my hand, and I thought, you know, you know what I really want? I, I mean, I'll take this, definitely. I think it was a dollar. But I, but what I really want is an omnibus edition. I have a, uh, oh, here they are right here. Here they are right here. Things like this. Can you make that out? Things like that. Uh, you, you've got uh, 
Tarzan of the Apes Omnibus, P.G. Woodhouse, Helen McInnes, uh, Dashiell Hammett. Uh, what I really want is something like that. So a book like that that contains the director of Justin, maybe a couple of other things, in one big dignified thing. And I found it. Uh, it's called Family Fortunes. It's three novels of Louis Auchincloss. So you've got the rector of Justin, but also uh, the House of Five Talents and Portrait and Brownstone, which uh, Portrait and Brownstone, I might consider his, his actual masterpiece. They're all three really good, though. Uh, this is an author who's completely gone and I don't think is in any danger of ever being revised or revived or given a second chance at a readership. I don't think he found much of a readership even the first time around. <laughs> I think he was just, he was just uh, fairly well connected to uh, the Kennedy family and the literary establishment in New York. So, you, you, you know, he, if he finished one of his wintry, very patrician, con precisely controlled short stories, he could just ring up the New Yorker and arrange to have it published there. And that happened throughout all of his career. But that kind of a career doesn't last. It doesn't, that kind of a career doesn't outlive the original possessor. And Auchincloss has gone to that country club in the sky long since, but I like his work. I think it's wonderful. If I, once upon a time, about 10 years ago at the Brattle, out in the sale lot, somebody got rid of just a row of his individual novels, just one novel after another after another. And I was really tempted by those. I didn't get them uh, because I, all I could think about was how much space they would take up. And maybe that's right to think about. Maybe my, my itch for reading Auchincloss can be satisfied with one book containing three novels, three really good novels. Maybe I don't need those to be taking up space. Uh, and then the next thing is for the gays, another thing for the gays, all the rest of these are paperbacks, but they were all oversized. I was still bent double carrying these things back here. But this is uh, a great anthology of gay literature. And I have had it many, many times. I've hauled it on this channel a couple of times. Every time I get a copy, I give it away. I'm going to try to hold on to this one. This is edited by Mark Mitchell and the novelist David Levitt. And this is Pages Passed from Hand to Hand, uh, a collection of, of, gay literature, including intensely coded gay literature from a time in American history when you couldn't do it, when you couldn't write it openly. Uh, hence the presence of Melville <laughs> in these pages. This is absolutely terrific. I love the introductory material. I love almost all of the selections. So I was happy to find a copy in perfect condition. I will try to hold on to it. I will try to keep this copy for myself. Then this next one is uh, literary history, which I love. I have a whole bunch of it here in this room. I'm not going to try moving the computer again, but I have a whole bunch of, bo of books about books. Not, in this case, books of prefaces or essays where uh, critics are writing about books, but books about the history of books. What form they take, what, how much we can ever know about how much ordinary people read at any given time and what they read. And I found a book that looks just mouth-watering. It's a perfect example of what I always talk about when you're out in the Brattle sale lot, you can take a flyer on something, you can take a complete chance on something you've never heard of before because you're not out of money. You're not out any real amount of money. The main question that I always have out in the Brattle sale lot is, can I carry all of these things? I just barely managed. That box set was a killer. But this, this is by Richard Rose and Mary Rose, and it is called Bound Fast with Letters, Medieval Writers, Readers, and Texts. Fantastic. Just fantastic. Could be really poorly done, but oh my, I just can't wait. Uh, I wonder if this actually tells us anything about it. Probably not. It's, it's got a bunch of blurbs on the, black, on the back, believe it or not. I know a lot of the books that will be that will be used as examples in here. No, it's all blurbs on the back. No, no actual description, but the title probably says it all. I, this is going to be high on the list for uh, more or less immediate reading. Then we have, this is an oddity, I grabbed this because I definitely want it, uh, even though, technically speaking, I'm already going to get it. It's a bit of a mystery. I'm a bit enigmatic, aren't I? And this is uh, The Complete Tutankhamun, and it's by Nicholas Reeves. It's a trade paperback about the boy pharaoh. It's full of illustrations, period illustrations, maps of the Valley of Kings, uh, genealogy tables, and also pictures of everything that was in Tutankhamun's tomb which was just recently the subject of a book. Toby Wilkinson wrote a book called Tutankhamun's Trumpet. Uh, this is a big, elaborate, visual compendium of 
not just what was in Tut's tomb, but also everything that we know about his reign, about the time period, about the immediate predecessors and immediate successors. And the reason why I say that I already that I'm already getting this, even though I have it already, is because this book is is about to be reissued in an enormous, elaborate hardcover from Thames and Hudson. Just beautifully, beautifully, as nicely done as this is. This is this is no slouch. It's absolutely full of of a wide variety of gorgeous artwork. But the new version, the same kind, the same book. As far as I know, it's the same book. Is a, really a, a work of art it's it makes this thing look like uh, a dashed off paperback version i don't know why that is i don't know why Thompson hudson is reprinting this i don't know why i also don't know the exact provenance of what that larger hardcover illustrated edition is is it the same text and if it is why why are you bothering to reprint it is it just that you want a text and you like the text by reeves and you might think well, if you're getting that complete, the new complete Tutankhamun by Nicholas Reeves, then why do you need this one? And the answer is simple, because uh, James Holder uh, writes about ancient Egypt for my book review journal, Open Letters Review, and he expects to be maintained in the style to which he is accustomed to. So if I get that complete Tutankhamun, it will go to him. <laughs> so I still want one. <laughs> I'll keep the paperback. I'll keep the much earlier paperback. This thing came out... I'm going to say in the 1980s. Is that right? Uh, 1995. And now in 2023, there's a new elaborate edition. No idea why. No idea what's going on there. And then the last thing, also a paperback. This one very much for me. <laughs> I don't care who wants a copy of it. This is very much for me. This is uh, one of the... This is Hal Foster's Prince Valiant. Who is... Um, do I have uh, anything? Prince Val, and I don't have Prince Val within reach. Uh, he was a, a cartoon, a newspaper cartoon character, a newspaper comics character, a, a boy in the king in the court of King Arthur, and it, he was the creation of Hal Foster, and was phenomenally popular for a long time, a decade, two decades, three decades even, and eventually Hal Foster got older and decided, I'm going to retire. I'm not going to draw Prince Val every week. The 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 uh, Hal Foster Prince Valiant comics were works of art they were just gorgeous uh and he could retire sure that's fine but the newspaper syndicate still wants to run prince valiant so they got other people to draw it and write it and prince valiant has been collected a lot over the years right now as far as i know there is no collection of a kind that i want i would like a believe it or not i am actually requesting it in this case uh, Mar Marvel Comics hardcover omnibus volume, which is more or less, roughly speaking, the dimensions of a hardcover, but much bigger and much heavier. Big enough so that you can appreciate the detail of artwork on the page, but not big folio size things that are impossible to read. As far as I know, Prince Valiant, at least a huge chunk of the Hal Foster years, has never been reprinted like that. Instead, it's always in multiple little volumes or big folio things, which are interesting in their way, and I know that they are meant to cater to art purists. But they don't do nothing for me. <laughs> I want I want to read one page after another in a thousand page volume of the Adventures of Prince Hal. I don't know that such a thing exists. I have a bunch of, of Prince Valiant. Uh did I say Prince Hal? <laughs> Hal Foster. I read Prince Val. I have a bunch of, of Prince Valiant, but I don't have anything like that. And I have comparatively little of the Prince Valiant that came after Hal Foster, even though I have no puritanical objection to it. And I found one today for a dollar. This is Prince Valiant Far From Camelot by Gianni and Schultz. So it's Hal Foster's Prince Valiant, but it's not Hal Foster's artwork. It's probably meant to look very much like Hal Foster. Yes, it is. It's very much meant to look like Hal Foster. But the artwork is by uh, uh, Gary Gianni who's a, a really good fantasy artist. Some of you will know the uh, the industry magazine, uh, the industry publication Spectrum. It comes out every year. It's a, a wonderful thing. It's $30, but it's worth the money. Uh, it's It can, collects all the greatest fantasy artwork and art, including sculpture, of the previous year. And it, award, it gives out awards for first, second, and third place and shows it all in great detail with almost no text just the attribution of where it occurs spectrum is a great thing to get at your bookstore if i had a retail bookstore anywhere near me i would probably order the latest one and gary janney is always in there for something or other it's always fascinating to see 
what's it what's in there a lot of the artwork that you would have missed and now the spectrum's gone gone on for well over two decades so going back to the first one and buying it is an amazing trip down memory lane uh, so gary gianni is known to me he it, one of the ways that he was known to me from spectrum is that he he was in there often for his barsoomian artwork that's really good interpretations of john carter and all of his supporting characters i am familiar with his prince valiant uh, be a lot of fun to read this absolutely and that was my uh my positively last trip to the brattle in 2022 i will not be going next week i will not be going to the brattle next week so this is positively it it was a pretty good brattle trip now can we do steve pyramid we have uh far from camelot prince valley but not hal foster we have the complete tutankhamun version 1 1.0 version 2.0 is coming we have uh, Bound Fast with Letters, a study of medieval readers and writers and books. Oh, oh fantastic. We have Pages Passed from Hand to Hand, a collection of gay literature in America. We have Family Fortunes, three great novels by Lewis Auchincloss, the forgotten Lewis Auchincloss. We have the Dorothy Sayers Divine Comedy. Fantastic. I never thought I would find this in a hardcover. I would have jumped for a box set of the trade paperbacks. Hardcovers will last a good long time. We have Tim and Pete, uh, James Robert Baker's ill-fated gay novel. We have uh, Adventures with Authors uh, by an um, author I gather was a big deal in his day. I've never heard of him before. And we have uh, Reginald Knox's Old Testament. Oh, no, <laughs> this isn't going to work. We have Reginald Knox's Old Testament uh, to go along with his New Testament. So now I have the whole thing, which is great. Uh, always in the mood for another Bible. We have Reinventing Bach, a study of all the different ways that Bach is played and interpreted and reinterpreted. And finally, Guns, Germs, and Steel, the one book on this list that I, needs no introduction, uh, that I'm going to give another try. I don't imagine that this, this trade paperback has been loved and read many times. That added to its charm. I don't imagine it will survive a reading by me, so this will be its last one, and maybe my last try at trying to understand why this book is so popular, or was so popular. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> I'll report back, or maybe not, considering how late in the year we are. But that is it. That is the last brattle trip of the year. Uh, and I'm thanking you for coming along with me on all of these brattle trips all throughout the year. It's been great fun to have people to come back to and talk about all the books that I get at the brattle. I went decades without having anything like that. Now, I have all my imaginary booktube friends, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, booktube.